did you receive that yellow piece of paper that says family Passover guide? If you have that, will you wave it in the air? If you do not have that, would you just raise your hand and say, I needed one of those and I didn't get one. Do we have more? That's a... I count on our families to have a Christian Passover celebration in their homes during this week. And if you've never done that and you're not sure how to do that, this is a simple guide to get you started. Say, I need one of those. I didn't get one of those. Would you just raise your hand? And it tells dads what to do this week to stop by the store, what to buy, so that you can be ready to have a Passover meal with your family and remind them of what Jesus and the disciples were doing as they celebrated Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread during this week. It's really special. So family Passover sometime this week, everyone. And then on Friday, we have our Good Friday service here at the camp this year. And it's a, um, a culmination of several churches, including our Spanish church that meets at the parking lot, right bottom of the parking lot right now. Uh, Pastor Jose will be here with his congregation, and it'll be a special time here um, on Friday night. No more than an hour. We keep things kind of simple and, and brief, but it'll also be kind of dark and heavy, and it's the Friday night after Christ has passed away, and it's a time of doubt and confusion and darkness to prepare us for a time of joy and celebration that's coming on Sunday morning. Easter breakfast, 9 o'clock here at the camp. We're hoping for good weather, but we're preparing for eating inside as well in case it's too cold outside. But we'll have the campfire lit. There will be food. There will be a few interesting characters mulling around that will want to talk to you. So beware of those people. Um, Heidi is organizing the meal for that for us for this month. Thank you for doing that, Heidi. Is there anything else we should say about the food? Okay. Because we want to try to do as much as we can outside. But no, I mean, packs look like they're mostly done. Look at that. Bring that food. Okay. Thank you. So uh, Pastor Jose's congregation is going to join us for breakfast. They grabbed a couple tags this week as well. And they're also going to join us for our worship service. His praise team, that is his kids, will be leading us in a couple of songs as well in Spanish. And he's going to lead us in a prayer time. And then I'm going to preach the sermon and he is going to translate um, into Spanish for his congregation. So we'll have a special, very special Easter together next Sunday. And then I hope you will have some fantastic Easter lunches with your family. So happy Easter season, everyone. And would you turn to John chapter 20? John 20 is our Easter sermon series, our Easter text. And today we'll be exploring verses 19 to 23. John 20, 19 to 23, and those references will be on the slides. But I want to ask you if you would do something there at your seats, perhaps as family or as friend groups. Would you look over at chapter 19, verse 35, and put your finger there? And then would you look over at chapter 20, verse 30 and 31? Put your finger there. If you are able to do this. Now, would you spend some time together reading those verses? 19, 35, 20, 30, and 31. Would you read those verses in little groups there, family groups, friend groups? Just lean over to somebody and say, hey, I know how to read. I'll read this.
what's John wrote this gospel? What is his heart? What is his goal? What is his thesis? What is he trying to do to you? He's trying to convince you that it's true, that it's all true, that it really happened. And, and what's his plan? How does he plan to do that? By giving you what? By giving you eyewitness testimony as evidence and in hopes that you will believe. He doesn't know you. He knows that there will be people reading his book. He knows that it has been sewn into a codex along with Matthew, Mark, and Luke called the gospel. And people will read it and it will be the eyewitness account, the best historical accounts, strong historical accounts that we have of the life and resurrection of Christ. And he hopes that when you hear it, most people will be hearing this, but then many people will be reading it that you will respond in faith by believing that it's true and that it will change your life. You might find life in the name of the Son of God. So, how many of you uh, will be really honest on a Sunday morning? Someone says, ah, I'm not honest on a Sunday morning. How many of you will be really honest on a Sunday morning and admit that you have a skeptical side? That there is a skeptical side to you. You have uh, found use for, I'm trying to remember who raised their hand. So you found use for skeptical Jason. You have found some use for skeptical Aaron. You have found some use for skeptical Tamara, right? They have their uses. I have my uses for skeptical Trey. Yeah. Skeptical Trey keeps me out of some trouble. And he helps me write sermons. But he's pretty annoying sometimes. Especially if you're a person who has the spiritual gift of faith. You don't like, skeptical Trey will drain the faith right out of you. And so when I, I have to deal with skeptical Trey, and, and in fact, if you haven't dealt with the skeptical version of yourself, then skeptical Trey definitely does not trust you. <laughs> skeptical Trey doubts that you have genuine faith, honestly. He does. This is skeptical Trey speaking. I doubt you have genuine faith if you have not dealt with the skeptical version of yourself. Because you're going to carry that version of yourself throughout the rest of your life. So you might want to have some sit-downs. And one of the, my sit-downs this week with skeptical Trey was to, it was to say, okay, you've, you've, spent, you've spent 20 hours poring over a text of Scripture. You know what it means. But here's the thing. Do you believe it? And skeptical Trey is like, eh. you know, the other Trey is like, yeah, I believe it. I just know that's the right answer. I'll just say that's the right answer. But skeptical Trey doesn't answer that quickly. And so I get a little annoyed with him. And I say, skeptical Trey, I sit him down in my office in that chair in there. And I ask him this question often. What is it going to take? And I still haven't gotten over that one yet. Jonathan, we bring that first slide. What would it take? Skeptical Trey, what, what would it take? And he comes up with some interesting answers, you know, like a miraculous sign. Okay, well, what kind of miraculous sign would it need to be? And, and Skeptical Trey, I, I, I give him an idea. Skeptical Trey, how about this is a miraculous sign? He goes, no, nope, no, nope, I'm pretty sure I could explain the miracle right out of that. Okay, uh, well, how about this miraculous sign? No, nope, I, I think I could beat that one too. And you get that right down to the heart of it. It's skeptical, Trey. There is no amount of evidence. Right? There isn't an amount. He's a, he's a true agnostic. He's a truly, truly a radical skeptic. There isn't. What about a near-death experience? I don't know. I'd like to think that would do it. Skeptical Trey answers. Maybe. Right? And then, I, and then skeptical Trey gets really discouraged when I tell him, here's the thing, skeptical Trey, do you like being skeptical? Not really. You are not going to get that miraculous sign. You're not going to get it. I feel pretty confident telling you that. And you probably are not going to get the near-death experience and come back from it. So, here's what you are going to get words. And all skeptical Trey balks at that idea. Words. I've learned to believe 
half of what I see and none of what I hear. And you're telling me it's all going to be built on words? And then you quote Romans 10 to me and say, actually, it's true. Faith comes by and hearing by the so when most people who become believers do so, not just because they've had their questions answered, because you can answer skeptical Trey's questions all day long and he can still remain unbelieving. They will wrestle with those questions and overcome intellectual obstacles, but the real reason people will become believers has to do with whether or not they respond to words. It is the Word of God that has the power to spark belief inside of even a very dark, cold, skeptical tray. Until he becomes such a believer that even though he's skeptical, he will not stop believing. He just won't let go. How many of you have had that experience? So deal with the skeptical version of yourself by asking them this question, what would it take? What would it take for me to be so sure and so glad about Christ that I would commit my life to him and to his continuing mission in this world? <laughs> that would be miraculous. What would it take for me to be so sure and so glad about Christ that I would enthusiastically commit my life to him and to his continuing mission in this world. A miraculous sign, a near-death experience, or words. And if I did decide to do that, what would it look like? Turn with me to John chapter 20, and our text today is verses 19 to 23. And let's do this. In the honor of the reading of God's word, let's stand together. And I'm going to ask Teague if he would come up here and read these verses out loud. So John chapter 20, and just follow along as Teague reads 19 to 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And the entire camp said, Amen. Thank you. Teague, would you just pray over this time we have? Dear Lord, thank you for this day that um, we have Palm Sunday. Um, just to give us some reminders. Um, number one, we're reminded that you are always worthy of our praise. Um, and if we don't praise you, even the rocks would cry out. Even all creation would. Um, and Lord, we also remember... Your plan is so much bigger than sometimes what we, what we think, God. And help us to just remember that this week uh, as we are ramping up for, for Easter and Good Friday. Uh, help us to be reminded that uh, we want to be in your will and uh, in your plan, your larger plan for our life. And Lord, please fill Pastor Trey with your Holy Spirit as he brings us uh, your word. And help us to have a good rest of the day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Teague. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Some of you have been uh, keeping up with things by making notes in your John notebook. And I know it is late now to bring this up, but we are in chapter 20 through Easter. Next month, we'll finish up with chapter 21. And somebody said, what do you have there? I said, what are you holding there? What is that you've got there? I haven't seen one of those. Who's that person? I never, I never bought one of those. Who is that that's in this room? I, I didn't get one of those. That looks like a nifty little blue notebook. You didn't get one of these? Lee, this one's yours. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Ooh. So you can make notes in there and circle it because we believe in studying Scripture. And let's pause for just a second and say, I'm so thankful for two different elements in the service today. We have a couple different elements in the service next Sunday with 
new friends. But today I'm, very, I'm just very thankful for our praise team, for Wildlife One, thankful for Keith Frazier and his skit team. So all of you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're not that big fancy church that has tons of drama people on staff, everybody. All these folks that minister to you on Sunday mornings, they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Thank you all. So many volunteers, precious volunteers that make this congregation ministry happen. Thank you guys so much. Okay, let's begin. First couple of verses here. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, everyone, be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And let's pause here for just a moment and let's say this. Jesus showed himself to his apostles, he, his disciples. He wanted them to know that it was really him. Jesus showed who he was to them because he wanted them to know that it was really him. And when he came into the room in verse 19, it's the same day, isn't it, everyone? Which means it's the same day as chapter 20, verse 1. So it's just evening time now. It's still Easter Sunday. It's the first day of the week. And incidentally... This is why churches worship on Sunday and we don't, we no longer observe a Sabbath on Saturday. Church as early as the book of Acts began to meet on Sundays because it is the day of the resurrection. And so I've heard someone say, well, that doesn't make sense. All those years of Mosaic law having worship on Saturday, they wouldn't switch it to Sunday. And that makes us all go, Hold on. something kind of big happened on Sunday right? Which meant that the church, every time the church met and every time the church meets today, at the very heart of everything we do is worshiping a Christ who is arisen. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And all the people said, because if that's not true, all the rest of it is in vain. Every Sunday we meet as a reminder to celebrate and worship Christ. And Jesus showed his disciples that it was really him when he came into the room, even though the doors were shut. They had closed them, and we're told elsewhere they're locked. And most homes during this time had a kind of lock or bolt on the doors. And the disciples had good reason to have the doors locked. They've seen what happened to Jesus. And there is that little phrase, why have they closed the doors? Why are the doors locked, everyone? You could do a sermon series that follows that phrase through the Gospel of John. And it would be an interesting study. Because you'll see that it appears often in John's Gospel. For fear of the Jews. Will you say that with me? For fear of the Jews. John's gospel tells us that the Jewish leaders were ready to ban you from the synagogue if you spoke openly about Christ. So remember the, the parents of the blind son? They didn't want to come right out and say what happened to their son. You know why, everyone? Help me. For fear of the Jews. Did you know that there were even members of the Jewish leaders themselves that believed in Christ, but wouldn't come out in public with it, everyone, for fear of the Jews? People were truly afraid that they would be banned, that they would be persecuted, because the Jewish leaders had put a lot of fear in people, and the disciples experienced that fear. So they've got the doors shut, but somehow that didn't stop the resurrected body of Christ from appearing. And by the way, the disciples, we should be thinking of 10. Now throughout the Gospels, there could be hundreds when the word disciples is used. But in this case, we're talking about the, a number that could fit in the room. We're probably talking about 10, which is the 12 minus Thomas and Judas. Right? Thomas just happens to not be there uh, for a very important reason we'll find out next week. So the 10 are together in this place, probably eating. And Jesus appears there and says to them, Peace be with you. The, the written account is 
Eirene humin, which is Greek for peace be unto you. But Jesus did not speak Greek. Jesus would have showed up and said the words, Shalom, which is a shortened version of Shalom Aleichem, peace be unto you. So let's say Shalom Aleichem, everyone. Which is something that you would go and say to people when you saw them on the street. You would say, Shalom, Shalom, which they understood meant Shalom Aleichem. On the Sabbath, you would say, Shabbat Shalom, have Sabbath peace be unto you. And when the Hebrew people said peace to you, they weren't just saying, hey, peace. You know, <laughs> they weren't just saying, I know, I know. Um, they weren't just saying all right, that's the best I've got. But they weren't, they meant there was, a, there was a heavy meaning to the word shalom. It didn't just mean, it didn't just mean uh, be calm. It didn't just mean uh, peace in the Middle East. It, it meant may you be, may you be whole. May you be healthy throughout body, mind, soul. May the, the shalom wholeness of the Lord be upon your life. Now, no one went around and said that, you know, the Walmart greeter. If they, you know, speak to you, they say, hi, good morning. And you say, may the wholeness of the Lord, you know, they wouldn't say that. They would just say, Shalom, shalom. And that's what that meant. So if you took time to think about it, you would understand that. So you'd say, shalom. And you would say it as a conventional greeting. In fact, if you're around uh, Jewish groups or synagogues or Jewish schools, you'll hear, uh, one time I was around a little Jewish school, and it was preschool, and a bunch of tiny little kids uh, with their little yarmulkes, little guys with yarmulkes, all the girls are named Esther, you know, and... <laughs> And, and, and Emmanuel, there was a little girl named Emmanuel, and, and they, were, they were walking by, and the rabbi would come out, and I would watch all the kids. It was so great. Would, shalom, rabbi. Shalom, rabbi. And rabbi, rabbi would say, shalom, little ones. But it's something that you would get used to saying it a lot, but it really had a meaning. So what you're going to find is Jesus is going to say this twice. If you read on, you're going to find out that he's actually going to say it a third time next week. But today he's going to say it twice. So the first time he'll say it, it'll sound a whole lot like this. Hello. It's a conventional greeting. Hello, everyone. Good morning. How you doing? What's up? Right? So if you were to show up in the room and nobody knew you were there, you might say, hello, shalom. But then he's going to say it again later. You know, like a, like a parent might do. Shalom. And you go, yeah, 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 shalom. And then they look at you and go, Shalom, right? He's going to punch it full of a little extra meaning later. But right now, he just shows up and basically says, hello. That's kind of surprising to this group of people who thought they had shut the door pretty well. And verse 20, when he had said this, like kind of at the same time, he's showing them his hands and his side. Everybody, tell me what that looked like. What did his hands look like? Right? He had nail holes or a wound. He had a scar of some type there. And keep in mind, this is his resurrected body. All right? And what else did he say? He shows them his hands and his side, which what does his side look like? Right? Because that was pierced to make certain that he was dead. And this is, that's right, dead, dead. And I know that for many of us, this is pedantic, but everybody was so important for the early church to make this statement. That the Savior crucified is the King risen, and the King risen was the Savior crucified. This is not a mystical resurrection. This is not a figurative resurrection. This is not a spiritual resurrection. This is a literal, physical resurrection from the dead. And that's what he's showing to them. Now, and most of us miss the importance of that. But the early church had to fight a lot of different groups who were saying things about the resurrection of Christ that almost sound like the atheist explanations of the facts around the resurrection of Christ. That it was made up, that he didn't really die, etc. And built into John's text is an apologetic that says, the Savior crucified, the same one who's crucified, 
physically crucified, physically died, is the king risen, physically risen. And the king risen, physically, literally risen, was the Savior crucified. Very literal resurrection, which is interesting because that's exactly the same kind you can expect Amen. one day. Romans chapter 10, verse 29 tells us Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren. So he points that out. It was interesting that also you could use your wounds as evidence in court. They were evidence. Your Honor, this is where she hit me. I told you. She hit me right there, that, that wound. You know, you could use that as evidence in court. So then the disciples were glad when they saw, remember that word, everybody in our John notebooks, we were circling that word like crazy because it appears throughout the gospel of John very intentionally, but especially here in chapter 20, if you looked at verse 6, you would find it. If you look again in verse 12, look again in verse 14, look again in verse 18, and now here in verse 20, you will see that all over the place, John is saying, so-and-so saw, so-and-so have seen. This is what I have seen, chapter 19, verse 35. This is my testimony. What kind of testimony, everyone? John has built his case on eyewitness testimony. And some people say, well, eyewitness testimony is not reliable. People will tell you all kinds of stuff. Well, why do we still use it today in court? Why do we still piece together crime scenes by trying to find an eyewitness? Like we could try our best to figure out what started all these random fires. Man, they were all over the place. I thought they were just down in Strasburg, but it turns out they had them in Culpeper County, and we drove past one in Orange and all over the place. But it would be better than trying to figure it out just by looking. We might have somebody that was standing there say, yeah, I saw what started it. I saw the power line go down. I saw the sparks. And you'd say, okay, that's probably good enough. And John says, this is eyewitness testimony. It's my eyewitness testimony. It's Mary Magdalene's eyewitness testimony. These are people who didn't hear about it. These are people who were there. Eyewitness testimony. So what Jesus is doing now is he has appeared. He showed his disciples that it was really him. Would you guys say that with me? Jesus showed his disciples that it was really him so that they could be sure. Everyone say, Sure. He wanted them to be sure his wounds were his evidence that he was literally died, the same Christ, he's literally raised, and they were his credentials. This is, this is why I am your king and no one else is. He wanted them to be sure. Are you sure? There's a good question to ask your skeptical self, right? Are you sure? Because John wants you to be sure. And he keeps piling up records and evidence and eyewitness evidence because he wants you to be. Because when, when life happens, you're going to need to be. And when, because when bad things happen, you know this already, but when bad things happen to you, guess who takes over in your life? Yeah, you won't say it. I'll say skeptical, Trey. You have to say, yeah, they will take over. And they have their place in your life, but when they don't let them take over your life. Because if they're in the driver's seat, you could be in bad shape. You need to have faith, Trey, believing Trey in the driver's seat. Okay, but when bad things happen to you, skeptical version of you will take over and bad things could happen. And it's in that moment that John wants to give you this ahead of time to keep that from happening so that you can be sure. All right? Sure. Uh, so many of you are not in a hard time right now like the one you're going to be in. These are the days to build up your certainty against the days that are coming. Right? John wants you to be sure. Jesus showed his disciples it was really him so that they would be sure. And here's the second one, so that they would be glad. They were pretty sad, everyone. So that they would be glad. Jesus showed his disciples that it was really him so that they would be sure and so that they would be glad. Glad about what? Can you imagine that skeptical Trey could even be glad? He wants skeptical Trey to be sure and he wants skeptical Trey to be glad. What would make skeptical Trey glad? What would make these people glad? 
Jesus is alive. And what does that mean? Would you say that again? Would you preach that to us? Just say it to us. Tell us that, tell us that again that we can believe it. Tell us again. There's our greatest joy. And that your joy might be full. Jesus said, pretty soon you're not going to see me anymore. Remember when he was in the upper room? Pretty soon you're not going to see me anymore. Then you're going to see me again. So that your joy may be full. And then I'm going to give you a kind of joy that no one can take away. And it is a kind of joy that basically says it's kind of joy where even skeptical Trey says, it's all true. Which means, what, what's all true? Okay, let me go back over this. That means that, that, that he is gone to prepare a place for me. In his father's house, there are many mansions. That there is a, there is a, that I'm adopted into Father God's family. That I will arrive in this heavenly country and spend eternal life with Father God and with all of his people and with his son. It's all true if the resurrection is true. And Jesus has shown them that it's really him so that they would be sure and so that they would be glad. And let me repeat this first part. Jesus showed his disciples that it was really him and then gave them the keys to the mission. And then gave them the keys to the mission. This next part is John's great commission. Right? Every gospel account has the great commission. Matthew, Mark, Luke, everyone has a version of the Great Commission. This is John's. Verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, everyone? Good, but it would have sounded more like? I like that second part. You just did. Shalom Aleichem. Let's try that again. Peace. Aleichem is be, un, be unto you. Peace be unto you. So he said it once, just like we talked about. Shalom, everybody say that back to me. He's like, good morning, shalom. And then later on, now he showed them his hands, he showed them his side, and they're all glad, and he, go, he does it again. Shalom. Which at first sounded like hello, but now it sounds like this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives it. Peace be unto you. In this world you will have many tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I have the world. It sounds a little more like that this time, doesn't it, everyone? Why are they going to need that kind of peace? Because he's about to send them. They're going to need, they're going to need that shalom. Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. This, I'm going to give you three S's here because that's what preachers do. Jesus now is giving them the keys to the mission and it is a sending mission. Would you guys say sending mission? Sending. It is a sending mission. Here are the keys I'm giving you authority. He says that exact thing in Matthew 28. All authority has been given in heaven, on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Here, he's giving them the keys also. In this case, he's using a very Johannine expression. He, he's saying, I am sending. The Father sent me, so I'm sending you. And this is a sending mission. Now, if you remember that in our John notebooks, we also went and we circled and we underlined occurrences of the word send or sent. And what you'll find throughout the gospel of John is that he uses those words and here's how he uses them. Um, that Jesus is the one sent by the Father. That the Father sent me to you. And in fact, in order to believe on Christ in the Gospel of John, you need to believe that he is the one that Father God sent to be our Savior King. You needed to believe that he was sent by the Father. And the Jewish leaders did not want to believe that God had sent 
Jesus, because that would mean they need to listen to Jesus. They would need to obey Jesus and to believe in him. So that was a preposterous thing to say. But the apostles believed that Jesus is the one that Father God sent, right? And, and he's going to use a couple different words for send and sent, but he's going to use them throughout the gospel. I mean, a list of scriptures this long, right? Another good Bible study if you'd like to do it. But now Jesus is turning it because Jesus has accomplished his mission. He said, it is finished. Very good. He completed every single part of his mission. He fulfilled scripture in every single way. And we saw in chapter 19, he was even fulfilling scripture after he died, when the blood and water flowed from his side. He's even fulfilling scripture there, chapter 19, 35, 36, 37. Jesus had completed his mission. So his part of his role in the mission is slightly changing. It's still the mission of Christ. In chapter 17, in his high priestly prayer, prayer Jesus makes it clear that he's, he's still involved in the mission. It's just that his role now is changing. He has made it all possible. And he's looking at his apostles, saying to them, this, now this part of the mission, I'm giving it to you. As, do you hear that? As the Father sent me. How did the Father send the Son? Something like, something like this. Uh, the Father with the Son in the heavenly realm says, Son, every single one of them is dying. Every single one of them needs to be rescued. You know what that means. The mission is yours if you want it. And the Son steps forward of his own free will and says, I'll do it. And he doesn't just do part of it. He does the whole thing exactly the way the Father wanted him. The Father says, very good. He comes with the Father's authority and with the Father's power. His miracles, the signs that he did were the works of his Father. Jesus said that over and over again to the Jewish leaders. How, how do you explain what I'm doing if Father God is not the one with me? Jesus did that over and over again. That was his apologetic. His defense of, of his ministry was that very thing. And now Jesus is saying, that same way that the Father sent me to do this mission, send to you guys. Why? Because I randomly and arbitrarily picked you? No. Because each one of you has been an eyewitness to my teachings, my miracles, the signs, but especially my resurrection. So the mission that I had is now yours, mostly by virtue of the fact that you have been my eyewitnesses through this whole thing. And there will never be any others like, the, like these apostles, eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. And Paul is a very special uh, case, but he also is an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. So anyway, back to our text. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. It is a sending mission. Everyone say, a sending mission. But it's not just a sending mission. Because we are sent, we are ambassadors, we are agents. Uh, the prophets of the Bible would often appoint a successor, wouldn't they? Elijah appointed a successor. His name was Elisha, right? Jesus is appointing his successors. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. It's not just a sending mission, it's a spirit mission. How many of you are glad that the Spirit is involved in the mission? He gives it its... Oh, there's a word. He gives the mission its power, its... What? Heart, its essence. He gives it its... You're all right. You're all right. I'm just trying to get a few more of these. This is, this is how I have fun on a Sunday morning. It's what? It's compassion. Its ability to actually succeed will come from the Spirit. He is the Spirit who, um, when you feel like you must be a part of the mission, guess who that is? That's not exactly a pleasant experience. When you get excited about the mission, that is the... 
when you show up and your skeptical version is totally taken over, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm going to mess it all up and get the gospel wrong. But somehow you just start talking and somehow, and your partner is like, yeah, that was a weird thing to say. But somehow those people heard the message and got saved. That was the spirit. Aren't you glad that he's a missionary spirit? He gives the mission its oomph, its enthusiasm, its passion, its power, its ability to last for 2,000 years. Its ability to run into gunfire comes from the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathes on them. Now you got to hang on with me for a second. I promise this is not just minutia. I promise this is... Um, to John, this is meant to be obvious. Jesus and the Apostle Paul used a translation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was their Bible, right, everyone? Okay? Genesis to Malachi, that was their Bible. They used a version of the Bible called the Septuagint, which was an old Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. It's a very good translation. It was very reliable and you can see evidence in the New Testament when you compare the original languages that this is what they were quoting from. Paul quoted from it, often Jesus quoted from it. That they use this, old, they use this version, like you use the NIV or the, or the New King James or some other translation, they use this Septuagint. And thanks to the Septuagint, the Hebrew Scriptures could survive through you know, different nations coming in and oppressing them and what have you. So, in the Septuagint, this Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, Genesis chapter 2, in verse 7, there is a word that's used that is the exact same word that John is using here. Jesus breathed. Like, will you make that sound for me? And literally, it's like a, like a puff. He exhales on them. What do you think that passage is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7? And he became a living being. It is the creation story. And this is not an accident. This would have been picked up by um, early readers pretty, pretty obviously, kind of a highlight. It's almost as if Jesus is recreating these men to be mission men, to be spirit men, to be believing men. He is breathing onto them. Everyone, this is not the Pentecost. This is not John's version of the Pentecost. This is not a symbolic impartation of the Holy Spirit either. This is, no, I wrote this down because I thought this might be helpful. There will only ever be one Pentecost, right? Acts chapter 2, which was the defining moment of the large-scale arrival of the Holy Spirit in fiery power. Let me say that again. It is the defining moment of the large-scale arrival of the Holy Spirit and fiery power. There will only ever be one Pentecost. But the Holy Spirit is not confined to one day. And we find this out by reading the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. The Holy Spirit likes to break lots of rules. He is the wild man among the Trinity. He's the one that loves to scare us to death right? So it's good to remember this when folks hey, think they have the Holy Spirit figured out. This is um, an arrival, an impartation of the Holy Spirit on a small scale by the risen Lord to a group of people that he had specifically and personally promised the Spirit to. And John 14, 15, and 16. It's like they'd been waiting, he had promised, and now he's He's personally and specifically giving, sending the Holy Spirit. And, and again, he is sending the Spirit. Remember, Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. And he's doing that right here. The Holy Spirit is not a date on the calendar. The Holy Spirit is not a contract to abide by. The Holy Spirit is a person with whom we enjoy a day-by-day -day relationship walking with him. Right, everyone? walking with the Spirit. So here he says, receive the Holy Spirit. It's a sending mission, it's a spirit mission, and finally, it's a saving mission. 
If you're, here are the tricky words. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That's probably not the best translation. I'm just, we won't go into the details. We don't have enough time. That's probably not the best translation. Some of you have the word forgiven used over and over again. It's probably not the best translation either. Because the idea of here is that forgiveness is in there, but the other, the idea is holding something, taking hold or letting hold, letting go of something as kind of the idea. So what we get from that is this is meant to be somewhat figurative. So if you read it the way it is and don't understand that there is some figurative nature to it, you're going to interpret it the way our Catholic neighbors do, which is what? The apostles have the ability, and the apostles and the priests, of course, coming from the apostle, apostle Peter, they have the ability to either forgive your sins or not. That makes you go, really? And the, and that's, the skeptical version of you says, really? Because you go, wait, why wouldn't Paul have said anything about this ability? It's kind of an important ability to use on the mission field, Right? Like, Garrett, did you, you guys probably didn't use that. It's, hey, okay, don't worry, I just forgave your sins. Boom, forgave your sins. Boom, got yours. Woo, that was a lot. Your sins, right? You would probably need to make this a part of your everyday theology. And I'm sorry for being silly, but it's not. It's not in the epistles. And that's not the best way to interpret what Jesus is saying here. But we all admit that when we read this, it reminds us of a text in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus talks about the I am giving you the keys to the kingdom. Remember that? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. And all of us go, yeah, right, I remember that. I don't know what that means either. Right? But if you, we did spend quite a bit of time on this passage before about the keys. So if you would, just hang with me here. Let me start with this. If Matthew 16 is Matthew's version of Jesus giving the keys of the kingdom to the apostles, and that's a different interpretation, a different meaning, then here he's giving the apostles the keys to the mission. I'm giving you the keys. Oh, and I forgot to bring my prop. Help me out, somebody with props. What am I looking for? Thank you, please. Yes, thank you very much. Good, did these, ra these rattle? Thank you, T. Right, right. I'm giving you, because you know this sound. What does this mean? What does this mean when dad does this? It means let's go, okay. All right, give me a note. What else could it mean? I found them. <laughs> That's good. What else? Sorry? I got a twitch. All right, hey, I've always wanted, I've always wanted this Cadillac Escalade. And I've always wanted to buy a brand new one. Ella, take her out. All right, what did I just do, everyone? Give her the keys. Now, what does she feel? What does she feel? Power. <laughs> Power. He likes me more than you guys. Power and? How's she going to feel? She gets behind the wheel. It's Escalade. She's adjusting the mirrors. How does she feel? I, sorry, I'm not. I can't focus on one of you at a time. Try that again. Excited. She's excited. She's. We're going to use a couple of key words. One of them is? She's very responsible. She feels responsible for what happens to this Escalade. She feels empowered because she has authority over this Escalade. I'm giving her all those keys. Yes. So let's do this. As I think the keys is the best way to understand this passage. Jesus is giving the apostles the keys. You want to collect these back. <laughs> Jesus has given the apostles the keys. You, that was a great throw. This is a really bad catch. The best throw. We didn't rehearse that at all. He gives them the keys to the mission. So now, 
I'm going to use another word in just a second. We've already used the word authority and responsibility. So you might want to, because that's the way it works, doesn't it, adults? Young people, this is the way it works. You want, you want the authority to drive, but with the authority to drive comes the responsibility. If you kill somebody, if you wreck, if you hurt yourself or your siblings or whoever's riding with you, the taxes, the insurance, right, the payments, the gasoline, the maintenance, the oil changes, tire rotations, you're the one that needs to know this because I want you to have the keys because that's the authority. That's the fun part, but also with that comes the responsibility, the weight, the gravity, the, but, but how many of you, how many of you are bosses in here? How many of you have people under you? Just curious. Um, how does it work when you give them the responsibility of a job, but not the authority over the job? How does that work? What happens? It, do, it doesn't get done? Because you've just made them responsible for five or six people under them, but you haven't given them the authority to discipline those people and make them do their jobs or fire them even. So now they're in a position where it's kind of a no-win situation for them, right? They need some level of authority to go with that level of responsibility. And you leaders, you managers, you know that kind of a thing. Jesus is, this is his figurative way of saying, I'm giving you both the responsibility and the authority. So I'm going to use this other word, and maybe for some people it'll help. I'm giving you full discretion. Full discretion. In Matthew 16, I'm giving you full discretion over your own congregations. You have the authority over your own doors. You lock them. You open them. That's up, totally up to you. The responsibility and the authority is yours. Here in John chapter 20, he said, I'm giving you all the keys to the mission. Every bit of it, I'm giving it over to you. The Father sent me, I'm sending you. He gave me a certain authority. And you know what I did with it? I'll give you an example. You know what I did with it? Jesus uses his authority this way. He's preaching to the Jewish leaders. And then at the end of it, he says something, something, I'm be paraphrased, something like this. And um, I think chapter nine, something like this. But you deem yourself blind. You are blind. So you won't believe. Like, how can he just say that? That seems like that would be a mission killer right there, wouldn't it? Right? By saying to a group of people on a mission trip, but you're blind. So I'm going to these people. He was practicing full authority over the mission. And you see that exact thing in the book of Acts. Now where the apostles have accepted the keys, the responsibility and the authority is theirs. And so they do things like, but you, I preached to you guys and you wouldn't listen. So you've decided that you're unworthy of the gospel. Whoa. Whoa. How do you say, I thought you had to please everybody in ministry. And it's like, so I'm going over here. I'm going, these people I haven't even heard yet. So I'm going to go to them and you guys, good luck. Right? And then they begin to preach to this person. I have some examples for you in scripture, but Jesus gives them the keys. And let me put it this way. Thank you, Teague. Everybody give Teague a round of applause. <laughs> let me put it to you this way. They have full authority, full responsibility, full discretion. And this is probably the best way to put it. I'm glad I wrote, I wrote it down. Full authority, full responsibility, full discretion, for all the forgiving power of the gospel message. Does that make sense? Jesus is not saying to them, you have the ability to forgive sins or not. What Jesus is saying is, I'm giving you authority, responsibility, and full discretion for all the forgiving power of the gospel message. It's in your hands, it's in your court now. If you go and preach this to people, then uh, they'll have the opportunity to hear and get saved. If you don't, they won't. The keys are yours. In other words, ah, Jesus is going to continue to be a part of the mission, but in other words, it could sound like this. It's yours now. Maybe you just write that down. For some of you, you get what I mean by that. It's yours now. I don't need the Cadillac Escalade anymore. I've got a bicycle from Walmart. That's yours now. You take it. That means the responsibility is yours. The cool factor is yours. The authority is yours. It's yours now. I've done my part. I, I bought it. I paid for it. Right, everybody? I paid for that Escalade. 
I've made it possible for you to drive it. Now it's yours. The mission is yours now. He's still going to be a part of it, everyone. Don't get me wrong, but he's giving them full discretion. Would you read this with me? Jesus showed his disciples that it was really him and then gave them the keys to the mission. And it was a sending mission. It is a, thank goodness, and it is a saving mission. Jesus showed his disciples that it was really him and then gave them the keys to the mission. And I want to close this way today. What would it take? What would it take? This is where we started. This is where we'll finish. What would it take? This is my last slide, Jonathan. A miraculous sign. Somebody said, you know, even my, my skeptical tray would even welcome a near-death experience. If that's what it would mean to finally believe. And then we look at scripture and we find out, here's what we get. Words. And that doesn't sound like much at first. And then we remember that Romans chapter 10 says that God has engineered this whole belief thing this way. That God will say something and based on those words, you'll either believe it and it'll change your life or you won't. But the word of God is your best chance. So I have a question for you. And I thought this would be a good way to end. What would it take? What would it take for your skeptical self to be so sure of Christ and so glad about Christ that you would commit your life to him and to his continuing mission? It's the first thing. With that, what would that look like for you? If you could just do me a favor, just try to imagine that right now. Here's what it would look like for me to commit my life to Christ and to his continuing mission in this world. I can see what, I know what that would look, it would look like this. Would you put that in your mind? What would it take and what would it look like? All over the room, let's take a moment and put that into a prayer. Let's turn that into a prayer.